<laughs> Good afternoon. This is Keisha Rogers, and uh, we're here today for a very lively discussion with Joel DeJean on the future of our space program and a very uh, specific topic on the rise of the rocket girls. And this is uh, going to be a very exciting discussion on the question of the women who shaped our uh, space program, who shaped the rocket program, and the effects of their work um, over the past several decades. So he'll be telling you more about that. I wanted to start off with a couple of brief uh, updates just to situate why we're having this discussion today and how it folds directly into Mr. LaRouche's call for the new presidency and how people should be thinking about the new presidency. I was very excited that Joel said he was going to be giving this presentation uh, because the way people are thinking about a presidency today is completely out of touch with the creative nature of what we are as a human species. Because anybody who's thinking that we have to fall in line with the lesser of these two idiots uh, for US presidency, uh, which there is no lesser, uh, is not really thinking about the foundation of how our presidency actually functions. And let me just make this point that Mr. LaRouche just a few weeks ago made very clear uh, that none of these candidates are qualified for presidency. Uh, the only qualification they have is to bring nothing but doom to the country. And that he is fully prepared, not running for president, but to shape what must become the effect of the institution of the presidency, shape the policies that must lead the presidency. And Many people may know that the initiative of that starts with first and foremost putting an end to the 15 year long, decades long drive by the neocons, uh, Bush Cheney, Obama administration's continued drive for war, and that being continued to be driven by the insane presidential candidacy of Hillary Clinton. And Mr. LaRouche has called Mrs. Clinton out to the floor and had made very clear that her campaign represents a continuation of this war drive. And I will go into some uh, very brief details, which I want people to look at for themselves uh, in re understanding you know, what Hillary Clinton's campaign is gonna be represented by. Uh, and this is, uh, let me just say, first of all, that Mr. LaRouche, over the recent year and a half or so, has been putting a strong emphasis on the role of New York, Manhattan, and in defining the presidency from the standpoint of going back to the understanding of our US constitutional leaders, such as those of Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, and others, focusing on the Hamiltonian principle of of economics as the driver for what the real presidency must be. And I think it's fitting that it is that location where this fight is extremely centered, especially with the fact that you have Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump both residing out of the Manhattan, uh, New York area. So the uh, stomping ground for those two campaigns is right there. And we're making the point that uh, we're going to call this campaign out from the standpoint uh, that it is completely illegitimate. And we've done that uh, by one, we're going to be putting out a series of newsletters and papers, which we have titled, uh, Lurush Movement in Manhattan has titled The Hamiltonian. And uh, the first of those newsletters, we're getting out a 10,000 run uh, copy of, um, this is, just the 11 by uh, 17 version of it, a smaller version, the one that they're getting out in uh, the New York area is I think like uh, 14 by 22 or so, but it's a news newspaper size. Uh, nevertheless, it is uh, the ha called the Hamiltonian. We're gonna be putting out a series of these different types of newsletters. The headline uh, subject on it is 
LaRouche, Hillary is Obama's stooge for wars and Wall Street. Uh, you'll also notice that, and you can find this on the LaRouche Pack website. Um, it has the petition that was drafted by Diane Sayer, uh, my colleague on the policy committee. Um, and the petition entitled Expose 9-11 Terror Networks and End Perpetual War. Uh, now, that petition is also on the website that people who have not gone on to sign it uh, should go to our action page and sign on to the uh, petition that we are circulating on exposing the uh, fraud, the, the terror networks behind 9-11. So people know or may know that uh, in that petition, I'll just say this, Diane called for uh, five immediate actions to take place. Uh, one, the first one starting with the public disclosure and release of the 28 pages. And that action after 14 years of on the ground fighting by the LaRouche movement and others that we've been in collaboration with has now uh, been taken, has now taken place. The 28 pages has now been released into the public. Um, so that is a big initiative and a big victory and breakthrough for the nation, not just the LaRouche movement, but for bringing justice to the murders and the crimes of 9-11. So I want to go through that for just a second here because, you know, people might say, oh, okay, that's nice. We got the 28 pages released. But if you only think about it from the standpoint of legal action, uh, action of getting a piece of legislation released, and not from the standpoint of, we're talking about human lives here. We're talking about, you know, the vividity of Mr. LaRouche painted it, that, you know, planes going into buildings, uh, you know, the, the lives that were lost and taken at the hands of murderous individuals that have not been, that this, has not been brought to justice or justice has not been served for those actions yet. That the 28 pages represents the first step to bringing justice. And the second steps, uh, the actions that Diane calls for uh, in her, in the petition that we've been circulating for the last few weeks now uh, is to bring forth a investigation into the FBI operations into the refusal uh, of releasing of the thousands of pages that have been withheld around the um, uh, areas that they that were hosting the hijackers at the time, uh, including in Sarasota, Florida, and other places, and New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, and San Diego, California. The third action is the Chilcot report, a Chilcot report investigation in, in the United States or inquiry in the United States in terms of the role of Bush Obama uh, in their complicity and cover up of protection, protecting the 9-11 terror apparatus. Um, as people know, uh, prior to the 28 pages being released, you had the Chilcot report in, in Britain that actually found Tony Blair uh, former Prime Minister of Britain to be guilty of war crimes, uh, guilty of uh, the uh, Nuremberg type uh, crimes uh, committed in his actions taken to drive the nation and drive the nations into a war with Iraq without going through the efficient diplomatic actions to put a stop to this or to work out the actions. Now, what's um, What's interesting about this is in the recent, just in the past, you think about that, that action that took place. Uh, Tony Blair is still facing major troubles, trouble right now from these findings. And we need a Chilcot report investigation because we have to send some criminals to prison. These actions cannot be accepted and tolerated. But now 
Uh, just over the past 48 hours, more has come out on this, uh, which would lead similarly to a uh, Chilcot investigation uh, to expose the cover-up and the uh, lies behind the 9-11 and also the fact that, um, as was found, this was an aggressive war and a violation of international law, as was found in Britain. Uh, but recently, I don't know if people heard this, but on 28pages.org and other interviews, former chief of staff to Colonel, uh, former chief of staff to Colin Powell, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, did interviews and uh, did uh, in this interview exposed the fact that during the time of the investigation of the inquiry into the nine into 9/11, uh, when you had the 9/11. Uh, inquiry commission going on and this was around the time that the bush administration said that the 28 pages would be uh, continue to be classified um, it was at that time that it's now been exposed that it was dick cheney uh, the vice president under bush who was going directly to the cia directly to other institutional leaders including people on the committee uh, of the 9-11 inquiry report and demanding and making clear that there would be no, uh, no disclosure of any involvement of the Saudis' role in 9-11, in these terror attacks. So this is important by the fact that just a few weeks ago, the 28 pages of release, it's the Saudi role, implicit complicit all over the place in this, in these crimes. And now we're finding out that Dick Cheney made clear that the, uh, we, this would mess up our plans of action. It just has to be, it has to be only stated that this is uh, Baghdad. We're going to stick with Baghdad. We're going to stick with Iraq. We're going to stick with, you know, that line, that story, Saddam Hussein. Um, so this is, when you think about it, this is what we're dealing with. This has been an ongoing neocon war policy. Dick Cheney did not go and, you know, deal with his heart problems and, you know, get old and decide that he wasn't going to be involved anymore. He is directly involved. The neocon apparatus are directly involved and they're continuing to push a policy as has continued under Obama to drive the nation into to the brink of total chaos and thermonuclear war. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the details of this right now because uh, you should do your investigation uh, on your own. But uh, I want to say, you know, first of all, that the uh, the document that's in the Hamiltonian that we're getting out in mass. Um, we were just down, some of us were in the Houston tunnels yesterday. We got out several hundred of, uh, of these broadsheet leaflets and that it doesn't just go through, oh, Hillary has a bad policy. We don't like her uh, or we, no. It is very um, direct evidence into the fact that Hillary Clinton has very, directly stated that her policy is going to be to continue the Obama neocon war drive. Now, when you look at this in relationship to what is happening in opposition to this war policy um, that has been directly exposed going back to uh, the, the the policy of Benghazi in September 11th, uh, 2012, uh, that led to the led to the murders of the U.S. Am uh, ambassador uh, Chris Stevens and others. Then it really shows, first of all, what it is you know what what we have to look at right now is what's playing out on the other side. 
of this? And how, how has this policy been completely boxed in and been uh, isolated is the word I'm looking for. Uh, in order to understand that, you have to go to why LaRouche is saying the, the strategic fight and flank right now in terms of isolating and boxing in Obama and Hillary Clinton in the United States uh, is represented by what Putin is doing and the developments that has just taken place uh, in the recent period with a series of meetings that have been held um, by the a series of meetings that have been held concerning Russia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and other nations, uh, particularly the fact that just a few days ago, you had a very important meeting, uh, meetings that took place uh, leading into the G20 summit and prior to the G20 summit with Putin and Erdogan, Putin of Russia and Erdogan of Turkey. Uh, and during this meeting, they met to collaborate on bringing, um, bringing an end to the Syrian war. And the reality of this is that Turkey has come to understand that the Western transatlantic system is not a winning strategy. It's dead. That they can either go down to hell with the transatlantic system and this losing uh, strategy because Obama and Hillary and the neocons and the war policy has been boxed in. And Putin has continued to outflank this for some time now. Uh, and so it was very interesting because you have a nation that was actually, you know, funneling and working to bring the weapons and the materials and to, to make sure that the war drive in Syria was not stopped, who are now saying we have to actually join with the future. The future lies in the Silk Road economic belt, it lies in uh, the Eurasian economic development plan. And so there were discussions leading to the completion of the economic corridors of the North South. And I see it as, you know, people, th that there's a recognition now that the only solution to the future for mankind lies in the decades long fight, which is directly defined in the 40 year economic platform uh, that Mr. LaRouche has been defining and which is now being taken up by Russia and China and nations throughout the world. And this is the winning strategy. This is the new presidency. So as people may have heard, uh, we're putting out the policy committee, the LaRouche Pact policy committee is now putting out a series of um, policy papers defining the new presidency and I would encourage people on the back of the broadsheet, a uh, very important article written by my collaborator, uh, Michael Stager, on the new presidency begins with LaRouche's four laws. Um, you should read this and study it and understand that it is the policy initiative of LaRouche right now defined by these four laws, starting with Glass-Steagall banking reorganization, wipe out the criminal banking apparatus, the deriv derivatives, uh, and move toward a science driver based on productive economy, increasing your productive powers of labor in your economy by investing large-scale credit into infrastructure projects that's going to determine uh, the future of the nation. And so, this gets me to my, my uh, final point um, before I turn it over to Joel, because, you know, one thing is the second of these uh, presidential policy statements uh, is what I put out, which people can actually find in the uh, 
this week's edition, August 12th edition of the uh, EIR, Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, the title of it is Manhattan Marches for Mankind. Uh, and for those in the room here and those listening on the uh, via YouTube, if you are not a subscriber to the Executive Intelligence Review, uh, you need to become one uh, because this material is going to really incite your mind and understanding about what we're doing to shape policy throughout the nation. Um, but I wanted to present something before I turn it over to, to Joel. Um, the statement that I, I put out uh, in the EIR for the president, presidency series, new presidency series, um, is entitled, The New Presidency, A Truly Human Culture, culture An Expression of the Creative Human Mind. And I just want to start off with, uh, well, I would like to read a specific quote from this. I would encourage people, it's, it's short, it's a um, very short passage, maybe a page and a half or so, a page and a half for the uh, paper, the statement. But Ms., uh, Mr. LaRouche has really been emphasizing the role of the creative human mind as the essential principle for defining the new presidency. And, you know, on his, his fourth, fourth law, uh, fourth point that he points out in the uh, actions that needed to be taken to save the nation, and for that matter, save the planet, as I pointed out, starting with Glass-Steagall, ends with the idea of the, the principle of a fusion economy uh, and a fusion science driver project. And you think, well, how do you bring this about except for a non-practical, non-deductive mathematical standard of who we are as human beings? Because we're not just talking about nuclear power. What we're talking about is a defining of a higher conception of an organized society, of a renaissance organized society that is based on creating creative individuals, creative human beings. And this is, you think about the essence of the space program from that standpoint. It's not from the standpoint of just um, different special projects in the space program. But how do you organize a whole society to be more creative and be more productive? And in that, that context, Mr. LaRouche has been bringing up Einstein a lot as representing a fostering of this creative identity of society, society fostering genius. And this is what, uh, what Einstein really understood. And so in that, he actually, in a article that Einstein wrote called Society and Personality, he, he writes, quote, only the individual can think and thereby create new values for society. They even set up new moral standards to which the life of the community conforms. Without creative personalities able to think and judge independently, the upward development of society is as unthinkable as the development of the individual personality without the nourishing soil of the community. So, and then, you know, LaRouche actually takes this this very question up and, and makes the point that from that standpoint that um, he just said of the fusion, quote, this is from Lyndon LaRouche now, a fusion economy is the presently urgent next step and standard for man's gains of power within the solar system later and beyond. Because that's what we're talking about. How do we actually come to understand and affect the world that we live in and the universe we live in from the standpoint of this 
identity of human beings representing a quality of mind that is completely different from other any other species on the planet. So with that, I think that gets you into what Joel will be talking about on these creative human minds that actually transformed our thinking about, uh, you know, the, the discover about discoveries that were made that actually transform uh, the ability of society to actually represent a, a new direction. So let me just leave it at that. Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll make a, a brief announcement about a very special report we have out. And so I'll, I'll save that for later on for people. Um, so let me just stop there and then let Joel come up. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Okay. Getting back to Dick Cheney. Um, uh, bring you down okay. a bit. Okay. That's it. Uh, besides a new heart, I already had another operation. No. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had a, a sex change. He, he's now known as Hillary. <laughs> but, uh, over the years, as I've watched various NASA probes reach their destinations, I noticed that a lot of the scientists and engineers that interviewed were women, a large percentage. And uh, this is uh, very unusual for these type of organizations. Now, earlier this spring, I heard on the radio of a very provocative new book that just came out called The Rise of the Rocket Girls. And I first thought this was about the Rockettes, or this must be about the uh, Rockettes of Tyler or New York City, but no, it was about the women who propelled us from missiles to the moon to Mars and beyond. Now, uh, instead of giving you an elaboration of the, of the book, I, I figured I'd start with the author herself, Natalia Holt, who gave an interview to NPR in the spring, in April. And I'd let you hear from her herself and one of the rocket girls who is now actually a, a rocket great grandmother. <laughs> so uh, it's about five minutes, so I wanted to play that audio. When the author Natalia Holt was pregnant with her first child, she started thinking of a perfect character and Google Eleanor Francis. Eleanor Francis is a Francis. She found a photograph from the 1960s, an astronomer named Eleanor Francis Helene accepting her When the author Nathalia Holt was pregnant with her first child, she was trying to think of the perfect name and Googled Eleanor Francis. She found a photograph from the 1960s, an astronomer named Eleanor Francis Helene accepting an award from NASA. Holt dug deeper. And so what I found is that there was this group of women who starting in the 1940s worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And that discovery led to the new book, Rise of the Rocket Girls, the women who propelled us from missiles to the moon to Mars. One of those rocket girls was Barbara Paulson, who started at JPL in 1948. She and the author joined me to talk about the role the women played shaping the American space project. Nathalia Holt told me many of the rocket girls had the job title Oh, in a time before the digital devices that we're used to today, it was humans that were doing the calculations. And so you needed these teams of people, many of whom were women, especially during World War II, and they were responsible for the math. Barbara, you were one of those computers. Yes. Now, in the 1940s, what made you believe you could be a scientist? Well, I had had quite a bit of math in high school. Both of my sisters prepared to be secretaries, and I just took a different path completely. But why I 
veered off into this, that, I can't remember. Nathalia, when you started discovering this story of these women who were so essential to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, does it surprise you that we didn't know this story until now, that it's taken know, six, seven decades for this to be told? It really was surprising. It was quite difficult to track down this group and find their stories. In fact, I think it was over 40 Barbara Paulsons I talked to before I found the right Barbara Paulson. You're kidding, really? <laughs> I didn't know that either. <laughs> yes, that was quite difficult. But when I found the real Barbara Paulson, the one I was searching for, it was so wonderful. And right from the beginning, Barbara had these amazing stories and incredible memory. And it was a wonderful thing, finding the real Barbara Paulson. Barbara, do you remember the very first story you told Nathalia? Like, here's an anecdote you need to know before anything else. It has to be a true by one. That has to be right in the beginning. I remember you told me that story very early. Well, Explorer One was um, launched uh, January 31st, 1958. That would have been after Sputnik had, had been launched. The U.S. is trying to match the Soviet Union in the space race. Right. The missile is in flight, but the success of its mission is still in doubt. It will take another hour and a half to know whether the satellite is in orbit. The most tense and harrowing way to go. I was asked to graph the results coming back from the, the Explorer 1 satellite. And I worked most of the night, through the night, at JPL with my mechanical pencil and graph paper and light table that I was working on. And those were, that was all the equipment that I had. And Barbara, when you found out that the launch was successful, what was your reaction? Do you remember that moment? I don't know if I'm an emotional person. <laughs> um, I, well, it, it was, you know, as I look back on so many things, I get more excited now than I did then. But it, it was exciting. I mean, it was great news that it was once in orbit around the Earth. Nathalia, how would you describe the impact these women had in totality on the American Space Project? There is hardly a mission that you can find in NASA that these women haven't touched. They have been there right from the beginning, from the early days of American rocketry to this first American satellite that Barbara's described for us. And then all of these amazing projects, the first planetary probes, the first lunar probes, they were there for Voyager. And even today, we have Susan Finley, who is NASA's longest serving woman, and she's still working there today at the lab. You mentioned that you discovered this story when you were looking for a name for your daughter who was born in 2010. Now that your daughter is five years old, what have you told her about these incredible women? She's heard a lot about this group of women. And my hope is that these women serve as role models, not just for my daughter, of course, but for all of the women that are interested in science. It's a difficult time for women in technology right now. It's, you know, so in 1984, 37% of all bachelor's degrees in computer science were awarded to women, and today that number has dropped to 18%. And even for women that are working in science today, it's about half of all women that leave mid-career. So I think these stories are important for inspiring and being role models that are, are so much needed for women today. Nathalia Holt and Barbara Paulson, thank you both. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Nathalia Holt is author of Rise of the Rocket Girls, The Women Who Propelled Us from Missiles to the Moon to Mars. And Barbara Paulson is one of those girls. Yeah, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's in the book. <clears throat> Besides the Johnson Space Center, the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, is, is probably the most famous lab of NASA. And uh, <clears throat> she goes through the background of this, this laboratory. It, it starts in the early 40s by uh, three young men, uh, Frank Belita, 
Jack Parsons and Ed Foreman, and a young couple that they recruit to eat their uh, computers. Now, the, the book begins with an explosion in the, uh, the first female computer of Barbie, not this part, but another part of Great Cambridge. Uh, she describes how in, in early spring of, of 1939, she was at the California Institute of Technology. She was a secretary. At, at that time, there were no women engineers in, allowed at the California Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. But uh, her husband was a, a grad student. But she describes how she hears this explosion coming from the roof. And it was an experiment that the, the three founders of the General Motion Lab, of Frank Molina and uh, his two comrades, who, who, by the way, after this explosion, they were known as the Suicide Squad. <laughs> was, uh, they had set up a, a pendulum with a rocket, a solid propelled rocket at the end of, of the pendulum, and the height of the swing of the pendulum would tell them the, the thrust of the rocket. Well, well, something went wrong, and the whole apparatus came crashing down. <laughs> now, uh, there was no OSHA or EPA at the time. <laughs> Thank and, God. And uh, uh, Frank Lena was the only one of the three who was a student of Caltech, California Institute of Technology. The other two were papers on. And instead of being kicked out or arrested, uh, his advisor, uh, a very famous uh, aeronautical engineer called Von Carmen, you know Von Carmen, he told him, well, you can continue your experiments, but you're going to have to take them off campus. So uh, they found a, uh, a dry riverbed in a canyon north of Pasadena, north of the campus. And they set up their laboratories, basically shacks, in the canyon. And their intent was to, to fly the rockets, to take measurements, calculate what the thrust was and, and try to figure out what was the best fuel, what was the best combination of fuels used in rockets. Now, the, their first contract was from the uh, National Academy of Science for $1,000. So they, they set up the operation. And in 1941, they were uh, awarded a big contract from the Army Air Force of $10,000 to uh, test what's become known as a JATO, a jet assistant takeoff. And their experiment involves strapping four rockets on the side of a World War I or a surplus plane with the propellers and wings taken off. And they chained the fuselage to the ground, and they fired the rockets to see how much thrust it would develop. Well, six months later, she reports in the book that uh, one of the, the computers, Army, she was called, was listening to the radio on December 7, 1941. And he heard what Linda LaRouche heard on the radio that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, had been bombed. So now it was serious. So the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was incorporated. Frank Molina was the chief engineer. Von Carbon was the director. And they received additional military contracts to develop this jet assisted takeoff so that airplanes could take off, heavy bombers could take off of the deck of an aircraft carrier so they could hit Japan. And they succeeded in this. Now, 
as more contracts came in, they decided they needed more computers, more human computers, and as the uh, author both described. Now, so they went from, from two human computers, this couple, to they hired three more computers. One of them was a, an older woman named Macy Roberts, who had been an uh, internal revenue agent. And, and she answered the ad and said, needed computers. And uh, she didn't even know what a computer was and what was involved, but she was quickly brought up to speed. So now it, it, we're talking about 42 to 44, the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab is building up, they're getting more contracts to develop the missiles for the Navy and the Air Force. And uh, there's a, a funny story in there where Frank is now the, the head honcho, the head engineer, and he's all of 29 years old. And uh, he was a real prankster in his graduate student years. And uh, Natalia Holt describes how, as he became the official director, he got more serious. And during a bit of downtime, one of the engineers in the lab was playing with a paper airplane. And Frank came up to him and gave him a scolding, said, you gotta be more serious. And the engineer was uh, taken aback because he had never been sculpted like that. And uh, he took it very personally. And it's reported in the book that after he built up a head of steam, Frank was in his office and this engineer took a hatchet and started cutting down the door to get to, get to Frank. <laughs> and it's reported that, that Frank yells out for help and uh, there were no tasers at that time, so uh, <laughs> two of the other engineers or employees sneak up on this this hatchet man, and what they did is they cut his tie off, huh? just snipped his tie, the real formal guy, and it so destabilized him that he, he calmed down. <laughs> and uh, two two of the uh, computers would reenact this. Uh, two of the, the lady computers would reenact this with actual scissors and ties and just ridicule this guy. Well, Frank at that point said, well, I'm gonna have to be more careful in hiring. So he decides he's gonna have to have people who can work together, because this is a remote location. They work 16, 18 hour days. And so it's gonna have to be more tight knit family type organization. And at this point, like I said, there are five computers, five human computers, four women and one man. And now the war is heating up, this is 1943, and the one man is either drafted or joins the Merchant Marine. So it's down to, to four women. And Frank promotes Macy Roberts as the supervisor of the computers and gives her power to, to hire and fire all the new computers coming in. So Macy, who, who was a, in her late 40s, decides that since he's in charge, she's only going to hire women as computers. Now, at that point, there were very few men around who were not in the Army, Navy, Army Air Force. So she had the, basically no problem implementing her, her wish. Now, in 1944, Von Karman is called for a higher office at the War Department. And that puts Frank in charge of the whole lab. He's now the director of the whole lab. Now, during this time, there was another student who had become a, an employee of the Jet Propulsion Lab, a man by the name of Xian Xuan. And uh, don't ask me to spell that. <laughs> but he was a, a Chinese student who had gone to MIT, came to the California Institute of Technology for his graduate and PhD work, 
and had been part of the Suicide Squad mm -hmm. and had basically led the end to the Jet Propulsion Lab. Now, he is drafted into the Army, becomes a colonel, and because of his expertise in rocketry, by the way, they, they called it the Jet Propulsion Lab because they, they wanted to avoid the word rocket. In the, uh, unlike now, in their early 40s, rockets was considered a, you know, a fringe field. And as a matter of fact, uh, I was surprised to see this quote in the book, but uh, Vannevar Bush, a uh, Roosevelt's eventual science advisor, criticized the uh, Jet Post Lab and said, well, why are they working with that nonsense, rockets? Because aeronautics was considered to be propellers, and they thought they had everything figured out already. <laughs> but this Chinese colonel in 1945 was in Europe and he was assigned the job of interviewing the Germans rocket scientists, including Frederick von Braun. Now, I, I don't know if he interviewed or talked to uh, Kraft Erika, that's not mentioned in the book, but here is this Chinese American working in the United States, being part of the military, interviewing what uh, she repeats the line in the book that these were Nazi war criminals, but these were people who were brought in as part of the paper clip and brought to Texas at Fort Blitz and brought over with some of the remnants of the V-2 rockets to develop America's rocket program. Now, from 45 to 50, the Jet Propulsion Lab is, is working with the Army to build up missiles. And they use the V-2 rocket as the, the base rocket, and they add their smaller rockets to form the second and third stage. Now, since they don't have room in Pasadena, or even in the outskirts of Pasadena, to launch actual missiles. They could test them with the dry bed, dry river bed. But to launch missiles, they decide they need to get further away from populated areas, and they go to White Sands in New Mexico, where there was a uh, test range. And uh, there's one report of, of a V-2. They, they fired off a V-2, and it veered off course and landed in Juarez, Mexico. Holy shit. And made a, a 50 by 30 feet deep crater. It didn't kill anybody, but uh, it upset the Mexicans. Okay. So now they figure, well, maybe we, we need a, a safer launch site with these rockets. And they were going to choose a, a place in California and shoot the rockets going south over Baja. Now, it would have to fly over Tijuana and Baja, and they couldn't get the approval of the Mexican governments, so they ended up in this swamp, mosquito-infested area called Coco Beach, <laughs> which, because of the use of DDT, was made livable, and this now known as Escape Canaveral, or Cape Kennedy. Now, from... 49 to 50, things changed the lab. Because in 1949, the Soviets, Soviet Union detonates its first atomic bomb in August of 49. And this sent the shock because uh, Truman was so arrogant, he thought he would take the, the Russians, the Soviets, 20 years or more to develop their atomic bomb. Now, at the same time they detonated their, their first bomb, it came out that there were at least two spies in the Los Alamos laboratory. And this, with the FBI's urging, causes mass paranoia in the national labs. And in 1950, the Chinese American who had formed flawlessly for the Air Force showed his patriotism was put under house arrest. 
because he had visited some family members who happened to have a connection with the Communist Party, so there was paranoia. And even Frank Molina, the director of the lab, was implicated in having leftist ties because he had gone to some Communist Party meeting in the 30s. So here you have the national labs are being targeted. <coughs> now, at this point in the story, in, in the Natalia Holt's story, she brings in Barbara Paulson, who you heard on the radio interview. Uh, she was Barbara Lewis, and, and she comes in in 1948. She's all 19 years old and studied math and chemistry in high school, but that was that was it, no, no college. So she becomes a central part of the lab. And the, the lab is getting more and more contracts and now they're they're working directly with the Huntsville, with the Marshall Space Center, eventually Marshall Space Center. And she goes through in, in detail what these computers were doing, because what they were what they were doing is they were they were running tests to see what was the most efficient fuel combination, what was the thrust from these combinations, what was the expected range. And they were working directly with the engineers. As a matter of fact, uh, Macy Roberts would, would say that, well, the engineers create the problems and we solve them <laughs> with our calculation. Now, there were many, many failures. They, they had all sorts of rockets blow up. They had all sorts of, of misguidance. As a matter of fact, in the early 50s, in the lab, they had a contest called the uh, Misguided Missile Contest. <laughs> and, uh, and she Holt reports that, well, this is not a, a slander or anything. The Jet Propulsion Lab was one of the only labs that had enough women in the lab so they could have a contest. But uh, Robert Paulson is, is a contestant, and they have all sorts of, of, of uh, escapades there. But they're working directly with Von Braun. And there's a report where they would have a, a cafeteria, a lunch cafeteria. And during most days, the engineers and the computers would, would go outside, being Southern California, and then have picnic tables set up. And they would discuss the problems they were working on. And she reports that one day she sat at the picnic table across. A, uh, a very handsome older gentleman who was, at, what he hope reports, it was a former SS officer, but it was Von Braun. And Von Braun was there to, to talk to William Pickering, who had, had now replaced Frank Molina, and he was now the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab, William Pickering. And at that point, but Braun was, was telling the Army, telling the Army Air Force, telling the Navy that he could put America into space using his rocket and the, the second, third stages from the Jet Propulsion Lab. Now, just to go through why the stages are, are necessary, I have my uh, rocket simulator. Here. <laughs> And uh, this goes for a Saturn rocket or a Jupiter C or whatever. Uh, most of the rocket is fuel in the control mechanism. This is the payload that the V2 rocket by itself could only reach one third of the necessary velocity to get into orbit. So, what they were doing was they were using the base V2 rocket, which had about 75,000 pounds of thrust as the first stage. And as it lifts off, burns the fuel, it drops away. And you continue to go through the various stages till your fourth stage. And if you gain enough change in velocity, you can reach orbital velocity, which is 17,500 17, miles to get into orbit. Now, what they did in 1955 and 56 is they, they set up 
various tests. And now she brings in uh, the uh, brings in a, a new a human computer called Helen, eventually Helen Ling, who was born in China. She's Chinese heritage. Lived in Hong Kong during the bombing of Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was bombed on the same day as Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. She eventually ends up in Notre Dame, gets an art degree, but loves math and, and chemistry. And you see this common theme is that most, most of the women who are eventually hired were obviously not engineers, because that was basically not an option for most women. But they were fascinated by math and chemistry and science. And most of the women were, during their high school years, the only female in their class, in their math class, or calculus, or, or chemistry. But they thrived in the environment of the jet propulsion lab, because what Macy Roberts did is she she basically created a sisterhood where they could interact and promote each other in solving these complex problems. And they, their work with the engineers and with the scientists was very collaborative. Now, Ellen is a basic, basically a new computer, but she's given the assignment of working on these second and third stages. And what she figures out is, is if you use, instead of a, a big rocket to follow the, the V2 first stage, she figures that if you have a combination of rockets, like 15 small rockets, and spin the stage to stabilize the rocket as it goes up, you can achieve higher velocity. So she figures out all these calculations. And Von Braun, in September of 1956, tells his superiors that if you give me the go ahead, I can get into orbit in the coming months. And for whatever reason, the Army, now uh, Hope, lays the blame on Eisenhower and says that they did not want a, a military rocket to be the first to reach orbit. They wanted some kind of civilian agency, a civilian rocket to reach orbit. So what happened in September of 1956, <clears throat> they have a four-stage rocket ready to go. It blasts off, and instead of a rocket on the fourth stage, they have a, a dummy rocket with sandbags as a payload. So that it, even if it came close to orbit, it could not reach orbit. And this test is the furthest that, at that time, that any rocket is reached. It reaches about 3,000 miles in altitude and it comes back down. Now, Ella Ling was really disappointed because she said that if that fourth stage had had one small rocket and had had a, any type of payload, it would have reached orbit in September of 1956. But that wasn't allowed. Now, there's an interesting story, which I wasn't aware of, that uh, in, in 1957, October 1957, Bill Pickering, who was the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab, is invited to a, a social event at the Soviet Embassy in Washington. And uh, she describes the, the fancy gold-plated stairs in, in the chandeliers. And uh, Bill Pickering is talking with the, his Soviet colleagues. And the New York Times reporter comes rushing through the lobby right to Pickering and says, what, what do you, or the administration, what do you have to say about the Soviet launching a satellite into orbit? And, and Pickering was taken aback because he, the Soviets had said they would launch a satellite, but he didn't think they, they, they were ready. And this was October 4th, 1957, Sputnik. And this sent shocks throughout America. And at that point, Lon Braun goes back to his, his collaborators, his, his superiors, rather, 
and says that if you give me 90 days, I can get into orbit. But at that point, there was not only competition between the Soviets and, and the United States, there was competition between the services, the Navy and its own program, the Army and its own missile program, the Air Force, which is now the, the officially a different service branch. It used to be part of the Army Air Corps. It has its own missile program. So there's a rivalry. And for whatever reason, the Eisenhower administration says that, no, the Army will not test the first satellite. We're going to give that to the Navy because they're more of a, a for whatever reason, more of a civilian program. <laughs> and this is the Vanguard missile. Now, within a few weeks of Sputnik, they prepare the Vanguard to, to launch. And it's this is they have live TV coverage. You probably get coverage of it on YouTube. And it lifts off, it goes about three feet, it comes down. <laughs> Massive explosion. And the papers, you can imagine the papers the next day, Splatnik. <laughs> for Puchkov, uh, you know, it's just total, total ridicule. And uh, so at this point, the uh, administration goes to Von Braun and says, okay, you, you get the next shot. Yeah. And since Von Braun said that he, he could do it in 90 days, he, he says, well, first 60 days, and then his boss said, no, 90 days. So they go into full scale mode to prepare a launch of what's called the, the Jupiter C the rocket with the the first stage the broad, broad rocket from Marshall um, Space Center eventually and the second third and fourth stage from the Jet Propulsion Lab and they are ready to launch on January 29th 1958 and the, the weather prevents the launch. The next day, weather problems. On January 31st, late at night, they get the clearance to launch. And you heard the countdown on the radio program. And so this thing is launched. Now, at that time, we have no satellites, no real fancy communications. The way you communicate and tell whether something has reached orbit is if you have these listening posts as it's going up around the world, and you listen for the signal from the, from the rocket or from the signal from, from the satellite. And this is what uh, Barbara Paulson describes, that what she was doing is she was plotting the trajectory of the Explorer 1 of the satellite, mm -hmm. determining its, its velocity, determining its altitude, and using her calculation to project whether it would have enough velocity of, of 17,500 miles an hour to get it to orbit. Now, uh, she, she explained it, but she's doing all these calculations, and behind her is Richard Feynman, the president of Richard Feynman, who worked on the Manhattan Project and was a very famous, uh, eventually a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist. You know, the, the president of the Caltech and the director of uh, the vice director of the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, standing behind her, watching her, and anxiously awaiting her calculations. Now, uh, Bill Pickering was not in the lab. Bill Pickering was in the Pentagon. And you had Bill Pickering, the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab, Vetter von Braun, and Van Allen, Dr. Van Allen, who has experiments in the, in the satellite, are anxiously waiting, and they have an open line to the Jet Propulsion Lab to let them know whether they've achieved orbit. And she goes through the calculation, and, and she says that at a certain point, she knew we had enough velocity to get into orbit. So she she begins to crack a little smile. And Richard Feynman, who is a very hyper guy, said, what are you smiling about? They were, they were making it. She, they eventually get the signal coming all the way from, from 
Florida, all the way around the globe, and 90 minutes later, they get the signal coming over California from the satellite, indicating its reach orbit. And she, she says, she spins around and says, she's made, she's made it. And at that point, they, they, they tell Bill Pickering, okay, we've reached orbit. And this is at 12.30 Washington time. And they schedule a press conference mm -hmm. And they invite the press at 2.30 in the morning for one of the most famous press conferences in American history. And I'll show you the, the picture of that press conference. If, if you can show the picture of the uh, three gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, I remember the, this picture, but I forget what Bob Brown is, is in there. Is he in the middle or on the right? He's on the right. He's on the right. All right. So you see that they're holding up the satellite, the Explorer 1, and you see how big that, that satellite is? Mm -hmm. That's the satellite. Huh? That's the satellite. It's about as big as a little wider. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Holding that up. Yeah. And that's what achieved orbit. Now, unlike the Sputnik, which just had a radio signal sending a beep so that you can hear it as it orbited, this satellite had a, a, a Geiger counter, essentially, to detect cosmic radiation. Uh -huh. The Geiger counter is essentially a, a, a tube with a, a gas, an inert gas, and if charged particles go through the tube, they ionize the gas, and you can count the amount of ionizations, and that's your tick, 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 that's your count of how many ionized particles come through the detector. Now, they didn't know what they would find. Some people had, had suspected that there was some kind of, of radiation belt around the Earth. But as a satellite goes around, it detects cosmic radiation, not just from, from cosmic rays, but from an actual belt of charged particles around the Earth. And that's what's become known as the Van Allen belt, or uh, Van Allen. Uh, I'm not sure Van, if he's... Van Allen, though? No. Yeah, it's made for the, the scientist who came up with the instrumentation. Oh. And he's one of the three. I'm not sure. I forget which one he is. No. Maybe may no. in the middle. Oh. But this is what was shown. And whenever you, you hear the story of, of the Explorer 1, the first American satellite, you see this picture. But the role of, of women like Barbara Paulson, Ellen Ling, Macy Roberts, and others, the, their role has, has basically been forgotten. Now, it didn't just end there, because what happened after this is you have in uh, 1959, the Russians send up the first living creature <laughs> into orbit, and they beat us. They send up a dog, Laika. And so they are the first to get a living thing into orbit. And Laika unfortunately dies after a few hours, but the, we didn't find out about that till later. <laughs> they didn't send a cat up there because the cat couldn't work the controls. That was France. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then it, in 61, uh, what happened? April of 1961, April 12th. The Russians are first put a man into orbit, Yuri Gagarin. And at this time, we have the NASA Space Civilian Agency. The Jet Propulsion Lab is eventually incorporated into NASA. The Marshall Space Center is brought into NASA. The preparations for the Johnson Space Center, which didn't open until 1963, are begun. And Kennedy comes to Houston in that famous speech on September 12, 1962, where he again calls for sending a man to the moon and bringing him back safely. Now, at this point, you have two tracks. You have the, the man mission, which was the, the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and you have the uh, robotic missions, which is the Jet Propulsion Lab. But the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was instrumental in the moonshot. 
in the Apollo program. Because before you send people to the moon, you have to determine whether a spacecraft can safely land on the moon. So now the Jet Propulsion Lab is out of the missile business. They're no longer doing missiles. And this is what the three originators of the Jet Propulsion Lab wanted to do from the very beginning. They wanted to explore space, go out into space, and they needed the military budgets to start off, but they eventually wanted to do like Von Braun and Kraft Erich and explore the universe. So the Jet Propulsion Lab sets up a program to, to first land, and it's not land, but crash land on the moon, called the Ranger program. And again, the, the computers, who at this time are not only using their pencils and graph paper and, and their mechanical calculators, but now in the late 50s, they're beginning to use these huge IBM 700, IBM 701, 704 computers to do some of the calculations. Now, some of these computers, the first computers would be the size of this room with all the instrumentation. Mm -hmm. And they would use vacuum tubes. I don't know if any of you know what vacuum tubes are now, but the <laughs> TVs used to run on vacuum tube. And they're like a light bulb but with three leads. And the problem with these is they would use a, a tremendous amount of electricity and the bulbs would burn out or the tubes would burn out after one hour operation. So the engineers would, would not use these computer, these mechanical digital computers. They would still depend on the human computers. And at this point, uh, Macy Roberts, who's approaching retirement, is sending her computers to become programmers. Because a human computers were used throughout NASA in the, in the early, not NASA, but throughout the uh, industry and in the military throughout the 1950s. But as the digital computers came in, a lot of the labs basically fired their human computers and went with the digital computers. But at the Jet Propulsion Lab, what they were able to do is to keep their cadre together and train them to become programmers of these computers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Holt goes through how the Ranger program was not a success right off the bat. He had six launches, and they were all failures. Either the second, third stage didn't fire, the video camera didn't come on. So about 1965, they were about to lose this contract. And they finally figure out all the, all the bugs, and they send the sixth Ranger rocket up to the moon, and it, it's as it's coming into the moon, the cameras are turned on and crashes into the moon. They get this beautiful video, <laughs> and uh, then they, they figure out well, if we're going to land men on the moon, obviously, we not only have to hit the moon, but we have to land soft land on the moon. So, there's another program called Surveyor where they have retro rockets set up. They come in and do a soft landing. And in 1966, the first one is a success. Now, at this time, uh, in the book, she goes through what's going on around these events. In 1963, the president is killed. You have the, the, the killing of, of King later on. So she goes through all that. But the mission is to get to the moon. So they get the surveyor. The first one works flawlessly. The second one crashes. The third one lands flawlessly. So at that point, they know that they can safely land a, a large object on the moon. And it won't get swallowed up. <laughs> so, but in 1967, you have the test of the first Apollo 1. And as you know, the test was only a ground test, but there was a spark in the three astronauts were killed. And this is devastating to the whole project, but they didn't quit. They kept going. They 
fix their mistakes. And at this point, you have the Apollo project ready to, to land on the moon. But at the same time, you have the Jet Propulsion Plan is also working on these planetary probes. And the, the first ones are called Pioneer. They go first past the moon. And eventually, they have another program called Mariner, where first they're shot to go to Venus. Now, at this time, we didn't know what Venus looked like. It was cloud cover. We didn't know how fast the rotation it had. So they, they send the Mariner 36 million miles to Venus. It takes the first radar shots. And it determines that the spin of the planet is it spins at 247 Earth days is one day on Venus. So there's no magnetic field. They determine the concentration of the atmosphere from the instruments on board the, these probes. And then they set up a Mariner 4, 3 and 4 are set to go to Mars. Because at this point, people thought they were canals on Mars because with just Earth-based telescopes, they could not tell in detail what was on Mars. So they said Mariner 3, which fails. Mariner 4 is the first to fly by Mars in, in 65, 66. They, they, they don't orbit, they fly by Mars. And they continue sending up probes throughout the 60s. Now, at that point, one of the engineers at the Jet Propulsion Lab figures out that in the late 70s, there will be an alignment of the planets, of the larger planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. Well, they determined that by the late 70s, there will be a, an alignment. And they, at this point, figure out that, well, we could use the gravity of the various planets to accelerate and kind of slingshot probes to go from one planet to the next. And this program, they, they, they worked furiously on to determine the best flight path to reach all of the planets. This is in the early 60s. This goes up the chain. And by the late 60s, in 69, Nixon comes in and starts chopping various labs. One lab in, in Massachusetts was eliminated completely. The uh, follow-on Apollo projects, Apollo 18, 19. He almost canceled the Apollo project after Apollo 15. Mm -hmm. But Nixon was persuaded to send 16 and 17. And the uh, 18 and 19, one was Skylab, the other is on the lawn there at the, the Space Center. There's another one at the Orlando. Know, near the Cape Canaveral. So at this point in the late 60s, the, the Voyager, what became the Voyager was canceled. Because Nixon said, well, the only thing we want is we want a complete landing on the moon, cut back the program, and the only thing he funded was the shuttle. All other projects were put on hold. Now, the people at the Jet Propulsion Lab, they didn't just give up. Just like when the Explorer, when they had it the, the, the ready to go in 1956 and kept the plans on hold until they got to go ahead, they kept calculating, figuring out the best path. And in the early 70s, they figure out a way to do the exploration that one fourth the cost that was estimated. And they get the go ahead to do the voyage. Now, at the same time, they have other flybys of Mars. They uh, have the Viking, which was the first lander on Mars in 1976. And she goes through in the book how they had planned to land on Mars on July 4th, 1976, our centennial. And because they sent, a, they had two craft, they had the orbiting craft and the lander. And when they got to Mars, they were able to tell the, the landing area with greater detail. And they looked at where they planned to land, and it was all 
rocky and, and not a very good place to land. And they had to wait till July 20th to touch down. And they landed on, on July 20th. And at that point, they were sending two vehicles. They had Viking 1, Viking 2. In case one failed, they would have a backup. And Viking took samples of the soil samples, some doubt as to whether they detected some kind of uh, life activity. But they determined they would have to go back to Mars. Now, at this point, the Voyager mission has been approved. And the Voyager 1 is launched in uh, 1977. And a month later, the Voyager, what became Voyager 2, is launched. And she goes in quite dramatic fashion. Now, they, they weren't smooth takeoffs. There were some problems with the computer programs. The computers kept crashing. But they eventually make it out of orbit. And they're heading, heading to Jupiter. We reach Jupiter about three years later. And the pictures, I, I remember when the first shots came in, in Jupiter and eventually Saturn and Neptune, and these were just beautiful pictures. We, again, we had no idea what the detail was on these various planets. Now they figured out that, that well, we need to get an orbiter around Jupiter. So at this point, they come up with what became known as the Galileo probe, which was set to launch in 1986 and at this point the shuttle is going up regularly every every few months and i remember this like yesterday in january of, of 1928 the uh, challenge goes up and explodes and the next 86 86 and the next shuttle launch was supposed to be the galileo and the one after that was supposed to be the Hubble. So what they do is they, they figure out, well, we can't send the, the Galileo with its anticipated booster rocket because they were going to use the Centaur, which was the uh, Kraft Erica's liquid-fueled hydrogen-oxygen upper stage. They, they figure, well, that's too dangerous now. So they have to reconfigure the whole track for Galileo, instead of a straight shot with the Centaur to Jupiter, they have to figure out, well, how can we use the gravity assist for Mars, come back to Earth, have the Earth give a sling to Galileo, basically came back twice around and eventually has enough velocity to get to Jupiter. And instead of three years, it took six years. It was eventually launched in uh, 1989, Galileo. Now, because it had to be in storage for almost five years, what happened is the antenna is like an umbrella. It's supposed to unfold when it gets into orbit. And what happened with Galileo is once it reached orbit, it was still circling around the Earth. They hadn't fired the additional rocket. They opened up the high, what's called the high gain antenna, and it wouldn't open, it got stuck. And they had to figure out with the, get the assist of, of the computers using their programming knowledge to figure out, could they use the low gain antenna to replace this high gain? But, but the high gain had 10,000 times the power of the low gain antenna. So what they had to do, and uh, one of the uh, uh, rocket girls named Susan Finley had help with setting up what's known as the Deep Space Network, where you have receiving dishes around the world, California, in Africa, South Africa, in Spain, and Australia, to receive the signal no matter what time of day. And they would have to figure out the programs to pick that signal from the noise and amplify it. And Susan Finley was critical in, in figuring out how to pick up that signal from the low gain antenna, even though the high gain antenna was not operating, because they couldn't go up and bring it back. So they figured out what had to be done, and they shoot the LA off to Jupiter. 
and they got to orbit in 1995 and using the low gain antenna they were able to take pictures of, of not only the, the, the red spot on Jupiter but they were able to determine that the moons of Jupiter Io was the most active volcano in the, in the whole solar system they figured out that the other moons of Jupiter, Europa, had ice cover and a possible ocean under the ice. So this set the stage for what went into orbit in Jupiter uh, last month, the Juno program. But this was, Galileo was a complete success. And eventually, after it used up its thruster rockets, they crashed it into the planet so it wouldn't contaminate the moons with whatever bacteria or whatever was on left on the spacecraft. So if you look throughout the, the whole last five decades, six decades, you have these space probes, you have the manned missions, that these calculations made by these women at the Jet Propulsion Lab, who in the early 70s, they were all promoted to engineer. And at that point, uh, you had several, like Helen Ling, who was the became the supervisor, uh, Robert Paulson, and Susan Finley. They were all elevated to be engineers. And at that point, NASA said that any new people had to have a, a degree. So what Helen did was she would train the, the new computers, the new programmers and send them to Caltech, where a lot of the professors were the engineers already at the Jet Propulsion Lab. They would be trained up and get their degrees and, and work at the lab. Now, uh, Holt, I'm telling you, Holt goes through the book, the difficulty of, of the computer. It's not that, that they didn't have a degree, an official piece of paper, but whenever they became pregnant, uh, uh, Barbara Paulson, at the time in the late uh, in the early 60s was now she was a supervisor of the computers because Macy Roberts had retired and Barbara Paulson was eight months pregnant and she tried to get a closer in parking spot to the lab so she called personnel and wanted some exemption and when they found out she was pregnant she was fired on the spot there's a supervisor of the computers she she was severely fired and uh but what happened is because they had such a close-knit group that a large number of them once once they had children and they were out of the uh, lab for some year some six years a lot of them were brought back in to work on various programs and uh, the whole goes through the whole drama of the, the whether they had cooperative husbands, and she goes through the various divorces and child rearing. But it, it was a real operation just to keep this, this group together. And because the lab had been set up to promote these women, they were able to uh, support each other through marriages, divorces, childbirth. And so Barbara Paulson was eventually brought back in a couple of years later to work on the surveyor. And now they're working on various uh, rover programs. You have the, in the early 90s, you had two programs that were supposed to explore Mars, orbit and land on Mars, and both failed. Yet one where there was a, a contractor in the Europeans and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Now, the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Europeans were using metric system. And the contractor at that time, who was supposed to send up the commands from the ground, was using the empirical inch file system. So that when, oh, it's, no. when it sent up the commands for the thruster, it was off by a factor of four. And when the, this probe got to Mars, it overshot here and the same thing happened to uh, another probe so in the early 90s they were about to cancel the whole Mars program 
but they, they were able to figure out what went wrong. And in 1997, they landed back on Mars for the first time since 1976. The Pathfinder, you may remember, it was the one that came in in the airbags deployed and it bounced. And we had this little <laughs> rover, Sojourner, who was able to, to make it off the lander and it functioned for something like three months. Right. And this was so successful that the same group, now with new engineers, is one that she goes to called uh, Syl Sylvia Miller who does a lot of the work on these Martian probes, they send up two new probes in 94 on Spirit and Rover. And to this day, the Spirit died about six years after it landed. Its wheels got stuck in the, the stand. And the Rover is still working to this day, almost 13 years after it landed. And the curiosity from uh, 2012, they were, these computers were critical in figuring out how to set up the curiosity. And in the Jet Propulsion Lab, they have a whole mock up where engineers are able to test drive the rover on Earth before they send up the commands to the rover on Mars. They have this like beach area where, where they play around with these little, little rovers about the size of a car. So now you have ongoing programs, but now there's no clear mission because the Voyager is, is now heading out to interstellar space. You have a, a follow on to Curiosity, but that's supposed to launch in 1920. You have the European Space Agency is working on various things, and, the, and some of these jet propulsion engineers were, were critical work with the Europeans to get them to that comet that they led on uh, two years ago. So here you have this wealth of experience and, and knowledge in how to work together and how to work with machines and how to make the best of limited capabilities and limited resources. And now it's being left to, to, to die on the lines. So as as uh, Natalia Holt said at the end of her interview, that if we want inspiration for the next generation, uh, we not only have to give them a history of what we have done in space, but we have to give them a mission of what we can do in, in coming years, working with Russia, working with the Chinese, eventually with, working with the Europeans, and working with other nations so that we could have a a real inspiration and a real mission towards the future. So uh, if you get a chance to read the book, I highly recommend it. Okay. So. I have a question about the staging of those rockets. I know this is kind of a technical question, but you were describing how um, you know, they use this, the, like the V2 as the bottom part, and then they put these other stages on. And then there was a, a breakthrough in figuring out how to maximize that acceleration potential. Well, what, the, uh, what Helen uh, Ling figured out is that if you had like a series of, of smaller rockets, and you spun them, they called it the tub. You spin them at, at about 650 revolutions per minute, that it'll be stable once it reaches a certain speed. So the idea is you get up to a certain altitude with a certain velocity. And after you get to that velocity, you drop the dead weight. Right. Because once the tank is empty, it's just so you drop that and now it's like you're starting from from scratch but with already a, a velocity of like 5,000 miles an hour so that you don't need as large a second stage as the first stage to continue accelerating and once you reach a certain 
altitude and you run out of fuel in the second stage, you dump that. And you can get to orbit with a smaller rocket in the fourth stage, and it just gives it that extra push to get it over 17,000 miles an hour. So when they did that first um, launch of the satellite, that first satellite, didn't they, did they know it was in orbit, like after it went, I mean, you described how she basically announced when it was getting the signal getting California. Right. Well, she was plotting it as it was going around the globe. We had different right. stations. Right. But at that time, they had no way of knowing whether it had enough velocity to stay in orbit. Right. In other words, it might have gotten up there, but then it might have fallen back down. Right. And that's what they fear. As a matter of fact, they, they were so fearful that it, it failed that when she, she gave the word that it had reached orbit, and they heard the signal over in California. And they sent the word to a uh, Bill Pickering. Uh, Vernon von Braun was, was going to say, you're eight minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they had to wait till they heard the signal to confirm that he had made it all the way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because I think that I was thinking about, you, you know, these women uh, and, you know, they were called uh, computers, human computers. And um, people were, remember, uh, Ian and I went to see, and some of the people in here went to see the uh, story of the human computers under at MIT, uh, women uh, who were called human computers who were calculating and doing the uh, mapping of star charts at that time, or uh, Henrietta Leavitt, um, who was, um, there was a story written about her called Miss Leavitt Stars. Anyway, what was, was provocative to me is um, just the, the quality of insight that these women had to have. It wasn't just, you know, they the, the women you're talking about were mapping and computing uh, the orbital velocity and you know what was actually happening with in terms of um finding the the orbit of these of the explorer going around the globe or various other things but i just in relationship to all of them uh both those who were at mit these women who were charting and mapping out the distances between stars and the relationships between the heavenly bodies in that way, and then these women who were uh, charting as you were presenting, it just really, sh what is remarkable is, and what's usually missing is that it wasn't just calculations, that these guys had an insight about what was going to happen before the calculations were even uh, done or thought about. They Something just was provoked in their minds in terms of, I bet she already knew prior to her, you know, finishing the calculation when the uh, guys were standing behind her, uh, what was going to be the result? Because she kind of, just in the process of going through those so-called calculations, already got an insight into terms of what was going on. So. Right, yeah, it's not just plotting the orbits. I don't know if I went through this enough, but to figure out the best fuel, the best thrust and weight ratio. You had to figure out, they, they actually had gauges on these test rockets. Uh -huh. And they would, they would have somebody take a picture because there was no Wi-Fi or <laughs> they, they took a picture of the gauge and from the, the gauge would tell how much propellant was being expelled and what the temperature was, what the pressure was. And from the various variables, they would have to figure out what was the specific impulse, what was the thrust of that engine. So in order to design the rockets, it's not just a trajectory, but the design of the rockets, it was critical to have these calculations. 
And the other thing is the guidance, because like that, that missile that hit Juarez, the, <laughs> a, a lot of times you can get the rocket up, but if you don't have the guidance, ah. you hit Miami or <laughs> some right, you don't know where point. you're at. <laughs> so they were instrumental. The, the, these, these women were instrumental in what became known as inertial guidance. And they would have gyroscopes huh. as part of the uh, payload package so that you could steer the rocket because the first rockets were steered like the drones where you would have a radio signal and you would give it signals and you give about a course but the higher it went the less effective that was so because of these inertial guidance systems they were able to tell where the the missile or where the rockets would go hmm. without keeping contact. And the uh, the network, the deep space network, because you can send it on its way, but if you can't receive the signal for what it's doing, then you just throw it up a piece of, piece of junk up there. Hmm. So the deep space network, and the, the Susan Finley, who uh, First was hired in 1958 and uh, was gone for like six years to raise her two boys. She came back to NASA and she was one of the engineers. What she, it was a funny thing, she, she didn't go to the finishing school in college. So she was elevated to engineer, but in, in 2008, NASA had a new engineer. You could no longer be grandfathered in if you didn't have a degree, you were a technician or a programmer. So she was demoted in 19, in 2008. And she was still, she's in her late 70s now. And uh, she, yeah, she's probably close to 80. But she is still working at NASA. And she was working on the Juno mission. And she was calculating the Doppler shift from the Juno when it came wow. into orbit. And by the change in the frequency, she was able to tell whether it reached orbit. So almost like the Explorer, but it's this time in Jupiter. So she's still working now. She worked so much overtime that they, she was given an exemption because she was making too much overtime money because she was an hourly now. So they, they gave her back her ticket. Uh, <laughs> so they cut her wages. Yeah, they cut her. She was making too much money. Oh, um, and she is is critical. And she had gone around the world. And she says, uh, whenever you see these probes get either land or get into orbit, you, you get a picture of the, uh, the mission control. And when they get the signal, you, you get all these high fives and everything. And she says, well, you know, all the workers are out in the field doing the test to make sure we get the signal. But she goes around the world to make sure these various dish networks are still functioning. Okay, wow. That's 80-something years old. She's, uh, well, she hired in 58. So she was probably 20. 19. A lot of these women were 19. But that's not she's she's not going around the world right now doing it. She's that. she's still doing it. Oh wow. <laughs> and she's still working. Well, the last assignment was on the Juno. I don't know what she maybe she retired. Maybe. Huh. That's okay. yeah. And their collaboration, they they had to collaborate closely with not only the engineers but with scientists. And because uh, a lot of times you get the engineers build this probe and they determine where it's going to land by the capability of the of this probe. But the scientists, they want to get the best measurements, so there's a fight there. So the uh, computers were kind of the balance uh -huh. between. Uh -huh. So, you know, tell us how um, we might find a 
is it the book uh, readily available or? Well, it was published in uh, this spring. Say the title again. I'm sorry. It, it's called what? What caught my ear was the Rocket Girls, the <laughs> Rise of the Rocket Girls, <laughs> and then the, the women who took us, who, who propelled us from missiles to the moon to Mars. And it's by uh, Natalia, it is spelled at A-T-H-A-L-I-A, Holt, H-O-L-T. And as, I don't know if you heard her, her voice, she sounds very young, she has a five-year-old. And uh, did, did you hear the radio program? I don't know if you were here, Betty. Uh, just to, when I came in, we met the speaker. Oh, yeah. Okay, but at the no, very no, beginning, no, she said, the way she got a hold of this is that she uh, goes through in the, first, in the preface that she was sitting in a bar in Boston with her husband. And she was expecting you know, three months, expecting a baby girl. So they were shooting days between each other. You know, well, how about this? How about that? And, and her husband said, how about Eleanor? Roosevelt, and uh, Natalia was dismissive. She said, Ellen, that's too old fashioned. I mean, but then, as she got closer to her due date, she said, Well, Eleanor, maybe uh, if, if I named Eleanor Francis for her husband's mother. So she looks up on Google, you know, Eleanor Francis, and she comes up with this astronomer who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab in the 60s. I don't know. Oh, she died in, in 2009, so she's not around. But she was one of the key scientists, astronomers, to detect ask near Earth asteroids. Mm -hmm. So she figured, well, that's, yeah, that's what I want to name my uh, girl as an inspiration to what she can do. And uh, she, Holt, is a, a microbiologist. So she had some scientific background. And like she says in the interview, a lot of these, these women, oh, did, did, did I show the picture of the uh, 1953? Why don't you put that up here? In 1953, now a lot of them you know, obviously changed their last name, so there's difficulty in tracking them. And uh, is it up? Yep. Yes. I can't tell which one is Barbara Paulson. Uh -huh. Are they at their desk or are they? They're standing, they're standing they're outside. outside. Oh, okay. yeah, because there was one at their desk. <laughs> but this picture, the archivist at the Jet Propulsion Lab, right <laughs> the archivist who gave her this picture couldn't tell the personnel records were not, you know, this is. 63 years ago, so a lot of them have changed names, a lot of them died or retired. So in 2008, when there was the 50th anniversary of the Explorer, the first US satellite, there was a big celebration at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, and none of them were invited. Hmm. None of them? None of them. As a matter of fact, she goes through the book how Barbara Paulson, who was Barbara Lewis back there, lived at that time in 2008, lived in Pasadena, mm -hmm. a few miles from the uh, lab. And another woman she mentions were you know, miles away. And uh, they, they were just forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. black lady there oh yeah she she makes a this is a, a key part of Janet Lawson uh, Macy Roberts who was called the she was like the dead, dead mother <laughs> that's what she says um, she interviewed this black lady and you imagine at the time California was very segregated As a matter of fact a black could live in Pasadena Area. But she had gone to UCLA and had 
graduated with a chemistry degree. And uh, Macy Roberts, who was the supervisor who interviewed her, it was so impressed that she basically hired her on the spot. And then when she was speaking in, a new young lady, Morris, I forget the last name, uh, her first, first question was, do you have any problems working with black people? Because <laughs> she put her in the, they were uh, best mates. She was, no, no. And uh, they ended up being best friends. So she eventually ended up, she got married, she went on to uh, another, another company. But it, she was uh, a key factor in the early 50s. Now, at, at this point, I don't know what the count is now, but there, the Jet Propulsion Lab is the largest employer in Esadita, California. Mm. It's like 5,000. And uh, I'm not sure how many uh, women and she, she gives a total. Oh, it's, it's, see, it used to be one percent were independent engineers, and uh, when I graduated in '80, it was up to like ten percent all around. And then now it's like fifteen percent. It's still very low. But you could imagine if, if people knew this history, you know, this is better than the STEM program, right here, which you try to get people in, interested in math, engineering, science. But if they could see how science and math were integral to what, what made the space program, and how you know, these people had a role, a key role, that that would be more inspirational than any gimmick. Yeah. yeah. If they weren't programming for uh, apps and Pokemon Go and things like that. <laughs> yeah. How, how many of them are in that picture? Uh, it's quite a few. Is there a caption in the. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Just says the Rocket Girls and Jake the L at the time. Yeah. So at least twenty. It looks like twenty-seven. Twenty-nine. It's hard to say. Somebody else there on the far right. Yeah, she doesn't give a whole doesn't give an exact count, but again, you know, they would they would come in, and a lot of the uh, some of the, the male supervisors, one of them was took over for uh, in between one of the ladies. There's one woman in there who looks like she's in her 60s, probably. Yeah, that's probably Macy Roberts. Yeah, right. That's probably Macy Roberts, yeah. But another one was, there was um, an old man who was interviewing at the time a new computer. And he actually told them, well, you're just going to, you're not going to last long because you're going to get married and have kids. <laughs> <laughs> was that a proposition? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know if it was Roger Hales. <laughs> but you can imagine. But I heard this whole description of the uh, misguided missile. <laughs> you know, they, but they had enough women so they could have a decent patch of But I think they discontinued that. <laughs> They probably get sued. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Very good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Can I get a DVD of that?